Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 16th episode of the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, a podcast all about the subject of antinatalism created by antinatalists. My name is Amanda Oldfansukanik, also known as Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, and today I'm speaking with the author of De la felicidad y los hijos, la evolución del pensamiento ético y la dimensión demográfica de los problemas. Miguel Steiner. Uh, welcome, Mr. Steiner. Thank you so much for uh, being my guest today on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Hello, good morning, good afternoon in Spain. This is so because the earth is not flat, it is round. Huh? We are here in the afternoon. Yes, indeed. Huh? <laughs> All right, well, welcome. Um, okay, so Mr. Steiner, this interview is a bit of a unique situation, really, uh, because you are you have, in fact, written a book about antinatalism. Uh, and sadly, I have not read it, uh, as it is in Spanish, and I unfortunately can only uh, speak and read English. So this is a truly unique opportunity for, uh, for both myself and our audience to familiarize ourselves with your work. Um, before we begin to, uh, a discussion of your works, could you possibly just tell me a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are, and perhaps how long you've been interested in the subject of antinatalism? Well, I was born in Austria, uh, near to Graz, the second uh, city in Austria, about six decades ago. Huh? And I grew up in Germany. In personal circumstances, this means a woman made me settle in Spain. I studied at the University of Barcelona, Spanish studies and philosophy. I'm against procreation since the age of 17 or 18, more or less. Okay, perfect. Um, what are your main reasons for being an antinatalist? Why are you an antinatalist? A serious depression when I was 17 years old showed, showed me how vulnerable, vulnerable we are and how much we can suffer. I was also painfully mindful about other people's and animal suffering. There are horrible and atrocious things in the world. I think that the pain of other people is objectively as important as mine is. It has its intrinsic, unquestionable importance. So the main point for me is to avoid, prevent and reduce suffering especially intense suffering. Of course, intensity matters. Uh, to suffer just a little bit is not so uh, bad as to suffer a lot and, and, and intensely. Yeah. And I can't guarantee the well-being of my children. I just know that there are terrible risks and menaces and that the more people are in the world, the more victims will be claimed by all the existing problems. Hunger, violence, disease, sorrow, agony, and so on. All our needs are sources of suffering if we can't satisfy them. And we can't uh, do it always. Mm -hmm. So I will not create a new life and a new death for what I think is a genuine ethical reason. Absolutely agree. Um, antinatalism as a word hasn't been around for a very long time um, and only used as a philosophical term since around like 2006. When was the first time that you heard the word antinatalism? Well, maybe it's uh, more or less 10 years ago or less. I yeah. presented a, probably less, uh, I don't remember. I presented a doctoral dis dissertation in the year 2000 it's called Etica, Sufrimiento y Procreación, Ethics, Sufferment and Procreation. Yeah. You can, it's an internet, if you look for it, or with my name, Miguel Steiner, or Etica, Sufrimiento y Procreación. Okay. It is about antinatalism, but I didn't use the word because I haven't heard it, but it doesn't matter. I didn't need the word to express my opposition to procreation. Right. OK. Um, I'm always interested in finding out how antinatalism is existing in different parts of the world. Um, what is antinatalism like in Spain specifically? Is there anything like an antinatalist community in Spain? Does Spain have its own history of antinatalism at all? I don't know any antinatalist, antinatalist group, community or, or organization in Spain. Very 
few people have thought about the matter and there's no cultural background at all. People could agree or not with antinatalism, but they just have absolutely no idea of this possible discussion, most of the people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And only treat procreation as a personal question. It always has been like this. And uh, before it was uh, normal because there, there were no tools, no? Uh, yeah. anti-conceptive uh, means. But now I hope that people get uh, more conscious about this, this question. Yeah. Uh, I hope so, too. Uh, okay, very interesting. Um, all right, so now I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, Manifesto Antinatalista, which was published in May of two th uh, 2020. Um, though it probably makes more sense for us, chronologically speaking, uh, for us to first talk about your book, I was wondering if you would mind me asking you about a very recent essay of yours on your website called Manifesto Antinatalista, which, unlike the book, I was actually able to fully Google Translate. Um, what prompted the writing of of this new work and how long have you been working on it? Uh, it's not quite as new as that. I wrote it in uh, 2017, but I updated it recently. I tried to get okay. people to be active and to help, maybe to create an organization, but there was little echo. Mm. I wrote it in a short time because it, in other books I had written already the basic arguments to defend the ethical importance of antinatalism. How do you wish uh, most people will use this manifesto? And what do you uh, most hope that people will come away from with after reading it? Well, as I said before, there is practically no cultural background for antinatalism. So I would like that my manifesto, manifesto gets known and causes uh, discussion. It's publishing by a publishing house uh, and its translation to other language, languages would be very interesting for me. Yeah. Who wants to sign it can do it looking for Manifiesto Antinatalista in internet. Hmm? Okay. Or getting in contact with me in Facebook, Miguel Steiner. Antinatalism is not a personal preference, but an ethical commitment for me. Yeah. That is why it seems necessary to me to reach public opinion. Okay, absolutely. Um, though I'm quite sure Google Translate is not doing full justice to your words. Um, it's really a great piece. Uh, and I was really excited to see that you are, in fact, a very suffering-focused antinatalist, uh, in that you make suffering a very large focus of your antinatalism. How did you come to the understanding of suffering as being the most important focus of antinatalism? Well, we are sentient uh, beings, we can feel. Right. The soul is a potential of suffering. This is my definition of the soul. Uh, we can be happy, but the important thing and, and what really matters is that we uh, can suffer. Hmm? Right. Uh, therefore, I say the soul is a potential of suffering. Hmm? There's no need to create possibly, uh, possibly happy beings but it is necessary to prevent intense suffering. Stones, for example, can't be happy, but there's no privation because you can only feel privation when you are living. Nuns don't have children and nobody blames them for it. Evil is part of sentient life. Uh, without suffering, without sentient life, there would be no evil in the world, I think. Mm. My point of view uh, could be called negative utilitarianism. Yes. Not the most happiness, but the least suffering is the important goal. Right? Right. Frequently, frequently we all accept some suffering. We accept some personal sacrifice, punishment, bitter pills, let's say, and so on. But we only do it choosing the lesser of two evils. It also can be helpful being positive and minimize the problem of inevitable suffering. But I'm absolutely convinced that the notion of right and wrong and good and evil would not even be possible without suffering. So be good, I say, and don't increase the number of potential sufferers. No? This is right. my message. 
what do you think of the forms of antinatalism that tend to put the focus on other issues without necessarily a focus uh, on imposition and suffering and all that? Well, there may be other reasons, uh, good reasons, no, for antinatalism. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the enormous population is an ecological problem with possible, possibly disastrous consequences. Yeah. The consumption of animal products means breeding and ill treatment of millions of animals who are sentient beings as well. But I think that suffering always has to be the central part of any ethical focus. Otherwise, it would be a mere whim. I just concentrate on my first and most direct convincement, which doesn't depend on the possible variation of circumstances or personal misanthropy. Uh, misanthropy, for example. In some groups in Facebook, you can see a lot of supposed antinatalists who don't reason but just express negative attitudes and even incite parents and children. Uh, this is not very useful for the cause. Hmm? Yes, I could not agree more with that. Um, what has been the general response to this piece that you've written? What, was there any reaction at all on platforms like Facebook, for instance? There was little response, but at least always positive. <laughs> okay, that's this good. It's an advantage. Yes. Uh, Antinatalism is a strange and unprofitable attitude for the for most of the living people. These usually see only the problems that already exist in life. Yeah. But the sense of responsibility uh, uh, should include procreation as an ethical problem. Life is risky and we create it, and we can decide about this, the creation of life. So this is um, maybe more or less new responsibility we have. Hmm? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, are there any plans on translating this piece into English? I'm trying to find somebody who could make a good translation. My English is not good enough. Uh, well, I think it will be possible soon. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. That's great news. Um, okay, fantastic. So uh, now I'd, I'd like to ask you some questions about your book, uh, which was published in uh, two th uh, sorry, 2012. Um, could you, I'm so sorry to uh, ask you, can you, uh, can you once again say the title of the book? De la felicidad y los hijos. La evolución del pensamiento ético y la dimensión demográfica del sufrimiento. I write in Spanish. I, I'm, my languages are German, and Spanish and English not, is not so good. Well, the, the translation is on happiness and children, the evolution of ethic, ethical thinking and the demographic dimension of the problems. My book is based on my doctoral, doctoral dissertation from the year 2000, Ética, Sufrimiento y Procreación, Ethics, Sufferment and Procreation, where I, where I analyze different ethical theories since Socrates until postmodern relativism. It is essentially a philosophic, uh, philosophic work and seems to be difficult to read for many people. I defend the Epicurean and utilitarian point of view that holds good is to feel good and bad is to feel bad. But it's not a symmetrical question, as I said before. The important issue is the evil, ultimately suffering, and the need to reduce it. Happiness never could be more important than the absence of unhappiness. If anybody is interested in reading the book, he should contact me. Hmm? Ah, oh, that's great. That's very generous. Um, yeah, I do hope I'll be able to read it at some point. Um, when did you begin writing the book and what inspired you to begin this project? I wrote it in order to have an easy version of my doctoral dissertation from the year 2000. So I started it in 2001, more or less, and there's a lot of uh, corrections and revisions because uh, I needed some time. Huh? Yes. But I already had my doctoral thesis in the internet and so I just made a new version a bit easier, let's say. Hmm? 
Okay, excellent. Um, okay, uh, again, sadly, I have not been able to read the book due to the language barrier. So I was hoping you could just, uh, in your own words, describe the work for all of us. What is the main focus of this work? Uh, and what are the key arguments in favor of antinatalism that you write about? Well, first I assert the relationship of suffering with our notion of evil and all our important judgments. We judge because we are, we are sentient beings, not because outside there are good and bad things, but things affect us. Huh? They, uh, well. Second, I oppose procreation from two perspectives. Personal perspective tells me that I could never guarantee the permanent well-being of my children. The general perspective is to take into account the demographic dimension of suffering. Okay, I see. Um, I know at least from the title, as well as some of uh, the other things that you've said uh, about the focus of your work, that you put a major focus on demographics. Can you tell me about that aspect of your work? Well, there's an evident demographic dimension of suffering. Population is, I call it, the sound box of all the problems and of death. One important way to fight, fight suffering is reducing victims. In spite of progress, the last century probably was one of the worst in terms of victims of hunger, war, disease, and so on. And this uh, century could be even worse. The population growth makes this possible. Uh, by the way, there's always dead waiting for everybody, and death is surrounded by suffering. Although I think that it is much better to be mortal than to be eternally exposed to pain, misery, fear, despair, and so on, you know, other ways of suffering. But death still is a problem which makes us suffer a lot in life. All our needs and instincts push us to life. Even though, and despite all the barriers, more than a million suicides, suicides occur every year. At least one thing is evident. There's a direct ratio between lives and deaths. The statistics, well, one life, one death, it's, it's obvious. The statistics tell us about the different ways of, of agonizing and dying. No? And their data depends on the size of uh, the population. I, look it up, uh, I looked it up a few hours ago in population counter, no? in a population counter, world o meter, world -o -meter uh, it is called. This year, till now, more than 75 million people have been born and more than 31 million have died. This only this year till now. And as you can see, 75 new people and 75 million new people and 31 million people who have died, that still uh, the population uh, there's population growth. It's, it's nearly the double of people. It's more than the double, double of people who come uh, into existence uh, than the people who die. Huh? Right. That's an even more staggering statistic considering we're in the middle of a pandemic. Um, yes, very interesting. Um, okay, uh, so I'd like to ask you some other questions that just you know relate more to antinatalism in general. Um, how does your antinatalism intersect for you with other subjects such as atheism, veganism, and the right to die? I try to be vegan. Mm -hmm. It's not so easy, but I try. <laughs> in order to reduce suffering of animals. Yes. Uh, I'm not religious because religious people want to think that the world is good because God is good. Hmm? However, reality and the excellent attributes of God are not compatible, I think. Huh? Yeah. Re reality should be different if God is uh, what people think he is. Huh? what uh, believers think is. 
And I don't agree that deserved punishment, as the religions say, resolves the problem of a cruel and conflictive world. Religions try to base, to base the sense of suffering on the sinner's punishment. Vengeful people go in the same direction. However, punishment, even justified punishment, does not eliminate the intrinsic negativity, negativity of suffering. It only tells us of a dilemma in a troubled world. So I'm an atheist. But there's a curious aspect in religions. Everybody prefers, without the slightest doubt, to enter in the paradise and doesn't want to be tortured in the hell. This, is, this has its, its significance about how people uh, think about good and bad. Uh, yeah? Yes. Uh, this seems to be a direct intu intuition of what is bad for a sentient being. Huh? Uh, yeah. To go uh, to hell. Huh? Although many pious people approve theoretically hell on earth, huh? punishment on earth, disasters, because it's the wish, it's the wish uh, of God. And in the afterlife, uh, hell in the afterlife, because it is also God's wise invention. Huh? Right. As for the right to die, you ask about? Yes. Uh, in practical life, frequently, frequently you have to weigh things up, and there are always may be different opinions. But I believe that an antinatalist will not reject euthanasia on principle because he attaches importance to the suffering. Um, okay. Um, do you have any thoughts on the different types of antinatalist thinking, like child-free, vehement, antinatalism proper, or ethelism? I think it is important to make the world less bad. Huh? The yes. question is not if you like or don't like children. So this is a difference between antinatalism and to be just just child-free. Hmm? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Child-free people who just talk about how annoying children are or about the advantage, advantages of living without children just express personal preference. Hmm? Mm -hmm. They don't help to convince people with other preferences. Hmm? People mm -hmm. who want to have children and like children. I have adopted two girls. Yes. If, mm -hmm. if people want to have children, adoption could be an alternative and even help to promote antinatalism, I think. Yeah. Of course, nobody should adopt if he is not interested in it. I just want to say that the ethical question is the creation of a new vulnerable person. Not if you like children or, or don't like children or get advantage of them. A new individual is something more than a desire. Yes, absolutely. Couldn't say it better. Um, you also have a social media presence, at least on Facebook. Do you engage much, uh, much with the larger antinatalism community online? And if so, what are your thoughts on it? Uh, well, communication on Facebook is very superficial and yeah. it's full of arbitrarity, uh, uh, insulting and stupid posts and commentaries. No? Yeah. Facebook is a disappointing experience for me. But sometimes you can get, can get good and useful contacts, uh, as you are, for <laughs> example, for me. No? Thank you. So it is a tool in, in any case. Uh, you have to be present in discussions, even, uh, even in, if the level is, let's say, low intellectually or because uh, in Facebook you have a lot of different opinions with, uh, uh, which are, I, I would say, not very intelligent. intelligent huh? Right, right, exactly. Um, yeah, but it's, it, but it's necessary nonetheless, so I agree. Um, 
Do you consider yourself an antinatalist activist? Do you think activism um, around antinatalism is a good thing? My main activity is writing so far. <clears throat> I think that antinatalists should defend their convictions also with public actions. Yeah. If antinatalism is an ethical cause, activism is a logical consequence of it. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, what do you feel like antinatalists so far are doing right? And what do you feel like antinatalists are doing wrong so far? What are the most important things that antinatalists should be doing right now? There's no organization, as far as I know. The few antinatalists uh, who exist should try to coordinate themselves in order to be stronger and mm -hmm. let hear their voice. But I'm not an organizer and I can't say how exactly. There are also many supposed antinatalists who simply despise children or do not want children or cannot have them and then generalize uh, their position or frustration. Yeah. Therefore, it is important to define well the ethical claim of antinatalism and avoid a mere misanthropic image. In other words, we have to try to reach public opinion. Maybe one day with good arguments, maybe one day antinatalists could create even a political party and defend the ethical value of not being bored. <laughs> it's to be a bit optimistic, but sooner or later it should be possible, I think. I think so too. There, there was in the UK, there was a political party. Okay. In the in the United Kingdom, there was a political party for antinatalism. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> ah, I, I, I didn't know, so uh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll look it up in the internet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, they, I just know that they it's, uh, that they didn't uh, won the last elections. Yeah. It didn't last very uh, long. Uh, no. Boris yeah. Johnson. Boris Johnson won. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Um, would you agree or disagree that the ultimate goal of antinatalism should be extinction? Well, this is a difficult question. I don't dare to give a clear answer because it is a somehow shocking uh, question. Okay. However, there is an enormous margin to reduce the population without having to speak of extinction. We are nearly 8 billion, 8,000 million people in the world, and population is still increasing enormously every year. Another interesting point to take in account for me is that uh, less population means less personal extinction. In fact, the closer we are to extinction of the of the species, yeah? mm -hmm. uh, the fewer deaths there are. Yeah. Or with other words, it is the procreators that generate deaths. Yeah? Yes. They have to justify the inevitable death of their children and the permanent extinction of individuals. I think. Yeah? Yes. And also. Human beings are the only animals, it should be clear by now that we are mammals, mm -hmm. but a bit different. We are the only animals with enough intelligence and cultural progress to be able to torture. This seems to me to be, to be a good argument in favor of extinction. Human, yes. human beings have created the worst evil that exists in the world. I would say. Do you believe that antinatalism should extend to animals, that all sentient life would be better off going extinct? Life on Earth has grown from zero to thousands of millions of species. No? Mm -hmm. Many species have gone extinct during the development of life, dinosaurians, for example. And I would say they are better off. Mm -hmm. the, de the defense of biodiversity is an anthropocentric point of view. Why should there be always more and more and more life? Yeah. It's an ancient life. Uh, 
uh, a lot of terrible consequences for, for the MMOs. The problem is what to do actively. And the intervention in nature cannot be an easy and clear project. Huh? So I just have to recognize that I don't know how, uh, what to do in, in, uh, in this uh, point. Huh? But antinatalism could be applied to other species too, I think. We should fight at least massive breeding of chicken, pigs and cows and so on and avoid their ill-treatment, huh? yeah. uh, provocated, uh, caused by, uh, by human beings and by the consumption of meat and so on. Hmm? Yes. Sterilization can also be applied uh, to animals. Hmm? Okay, yes, absolutely. Do you have plans to continue to write about antinatalism in the future? My plan is to improve my literary resources and to have texts of all possible extensions and forms. I'm also writing fiction where antinatalism is present. Ooh. I've written and, and uh, been working on several uh, works and several writings. Uh, I would like to see published, all written in Spanish. Well, the future, I'll see in the future what, uh, what may be published of my works. Okay, wonderful. I'm looking forward to that. What do you most hope for antinatalism to ultimately accomplish? You should try to change the, the egoistic point of view, which is the basis of procreation. Hmm? It's, it's not always egoism. Sometimes it's uh, a lack of control. No? So yeah. we should improve control too. Huh? Yes. And fight against, uh, fight ideology, which is against uh, uh, birth control, huh? as uh, the ideology, ideology of several uh, religious churches. Huh? Population is uh, increasing, still increasing dramatically. Yeah? It should be shrinking, shrinking by the pacific means of anti-conception. The slogan should be, uh, I'll say it drastically, <laughs> make love, not babies. Yeah? Yes. <laughs> In Spanish, uh, sexo si, hijos no. Hmm? Okay. okay. You can't resolve the problems of sentient nature, uh, bound to be cruel since animal, uh, animals exist, but you can reduce uh, the problems. Suffering is a viable part of life because its pressure, its pressure controls our conduct, our behavior. We have to escape from suffering, and this means in nature, satisfy our needs, survive and procreate. As I sometimes say, Pain is the electric fence of life. And also sex uh, is a need for many people. By reasoning, we can control the consequences of our, of our sexual instinct and escape the trap, the trap of nature, separating sex and procreation. Since we can control procreation, we have a new responsibility. By preventing life, we have to control the demographic dimension of suffering. Obviously, the numbers matter. If not, we would not persecute uh, crime or try to end wars or feed our children. It would cause few terrible cases and many terrible cases would be just the same. Therefore, the demographic dimension is important. We should not add new victims to the world. We should not supply, supply the hangman with new lives. Procreators do, I think. Yes. Okay. That's excellent. All right. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for being my guest on the Exploring Antinatalism podcast, Miguel. It's been a pleasure speaking with you uh, and learning more about your work. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Please visit Miguel Steiner at antinatalismo.wordpress.com and make sure to follow him on Facebook at facebook.com slash miguel.steiner.31. The Exploring Antinatalism podcast regrets to announce the death of creep the star of Exploring Antinatalism episode number 14. Creep was an incredibly talented young man, and he will be tremendously missed by all who knew him. His memory will live on 
and no doubt appreciation for his remarkable music will only continue to grow. Goodbye, Creep. Thank you for your contributions to antinatalism. If the unborn could thank you, I know that they would. Thank you for listening to the Exploring Antinatalism podcast. Once again, this has been Old Fan. You can find me at Forever Wolf Films on YouTube, as well as keep up with my daily antinatalist news updates at Antinatal News on Twitter. Please follow the podcast on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and email me at exploringantinatalism at gmail.com. The podcast can be listened to on the YouTube channel Exploring Antinatalism Podcast, as well as Buzzsprout, Apple Podcasts, and Stitcher and proudly announcing the official website for the Exploring Antinatalism podcast has been completed, and it is gorgeous. Designed by the amazing Visions Noirs. Please visit Visions Noirs at www.bialnoir.com, and be sure to check out our links for more. Please don't forget to visit the podcast at www.exploringantinatalism.com. Podcast artwork donated by the incredible Life Sucks. All the best, and bye for now.